Hi, right, going to break bread thinking about Revelation chapter 12. And you'll see the connection between that chapter and what we're here to do, to think about the Lord's blood and death in due course. Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come here to glory in the fact that your Son died for us, that he gave his life and his blood so that we might be redeemed, so that we might be in him, so that we might make that faithful and true witness as he did. And Father, we have signed up in baptism and in lives lived in him to living out his death so that the death that he died and the life that he lived might be our death and might be our life. Father, we pray that we might endure, that we might have our eyes open to the book of Revelation so that we might perceive that we are more than conquerors already, that we are winners in your Son, and that finally the forces of evil and sin which we have partly within our own minds and in our own mortality and in the world around us, that these shall not triumph but that ultimately we shall triumph and have already triumphed. Help us, Father, to grasp the wonder of this and to see your world and your kingdom and to not labour under the ideology and the regime of thought and constructs of this world. Father, be with all who are your true children, wherever they are, going through persecution. Be with those, Father, who day by day, life just seems impossible. Day by day is just existence and clinging on and and seems struggling endlessly uphill against impossible odds. Father, comfort all of us with these visions of victory, with these visions of something far greater than that which is in front of our our eyes. Help us, Father, to see that far bigger picture of your love and of your victory and the victory of your dear son. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, the book of Revelation, as I've been saying in in these talks, was given primarily to Jewish Christians who were tempted to do two things, to assimilate with the world around them. Some of them were going off into the Roman way of the cult of empire, worshipping Caesar and slipping away into the idea that the Roman Empire was effectively the kingdom of God and Caesar was the great king. Others were assimilating back into Jewish militant thought. It's the run-up to AD 70 and the Jewish war. The idea that we Jews can, in the spirit of the Maccabees, by heroism, by martyrdom, we can win David against Goliath. We can throw off the yoke of Rome and establish some sort of, the kingdom of God, right here and now. Jesus didn't play any big part in their thinking. So there was the tendency on one side to assimilate into the world around us, and on the other side, just as happens today, to become inward-looking and fight and, and war amongst ourselves within that community that has apparently come out of the world to become so insular and inward-looking that you, you wreck it anyway. They're the same basic tendencies that all the people of God have had and still have at any point in history. Well, I'm not going to sweat the details of exposition here in in any of these visions in Revelation. What does this symbolism mean? What's that dragon? What's this? Because most of the children of God down the years have been illiterate. And that's why the book of Revelation is so visual. The whole thing is extremely visual. The simple takeaway is that Jesus wins. Dragons, scary monsters, super creeps, but Jesus wins. That's the idea. And that what appears to be so invincible, the world system, the structure that is around you that appears to be absolutely massive and invincible, has already been overcome. And although we shall suffer under it, we shall ultimately be the victors, because we already are. That's the point. So, start off then in verse 3. The great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. You think of the lamb. 
You see, just as those two cities, Babylon versus Jerusalem, Babylon is kind of Rome, versus the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, so there is the Lamb who has seven heads in chapter, chapter 5, Jesus, the lamb looking as if it has just been slain, that is the lamb presumably with some blood on it, pitted against this dragon and the other beasts that are going to appear later in Revelation. And of course the lamb is going to win. And we're told later on here, verse 11, they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. So, Jesus at this point, had already died. The whole idea of calling him a lamb immediately connects with the idea of sacrifice, the Passover lamb slain for the sins and the redemption of, of Israel, etc. Memorialized in this, in this bread and wine, Christ our Passover lamb is slain for us. So the battle between the lamb and the scary red dragon is all, already won, if you like. You see, that was the visual symbolism. If you can imagine that you, if you try to get a second naivety, that you're an illiterate person, right? So you're therefore more open to visual imagery because you can't read, and you don't have Bibles on your phone, and you don't have Bibles on your, on your bookshelf at home at all. All you've got is the imagery, that you heard at church when somebody was reading the scroll of Revelation. There's the lamb that's been freshly slain with seven heads, and whoa, here's a big red dragon. So you think the lamb, yeah, the sweet Passover lamb just been killed, so it's got blood, some blood on its, on its wool kind of thing. And whoa, he's pitted against the scary red dragon. And by his red blood, the scary red dragon and all that's connected with him, his prophets, his false prophet, the other beasts, etc., is all overcome. Whoa. Red beats red. <laughs> the red blood of Jesus beats the red dragon. That's the idea. But the idea, of course, was that we've already got that victory. Well, as I say, verse 11, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. One theme throughout Revelation is of persecution, that the people of God are under persecution and are temporarily dominated by the dragon, the beast, or whatever. But they win. They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. That is because Jesus had shed his blood for our forgiveness to ensure the certainty of our hope of God's kingdom. Well, that had already happened. So straight away, the idea is anything else that's going to fight against the lamb is a born loser. That this great scary red dragon that appears invincible is in fact a born loser. You may lose your life to him, but in fact he's a born loser. They overcome him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. Overcome is a big theme. At the end of all the letters in Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, there's the promise, to him that overcomes. And those letters connect with the later visions. In other words, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the lampstand, however you want to look at it, the individual believers, we will overcome. And you read on later in Revelation, oh, what do we overcome? We overcome the dragon and the apparently invincible impenetrable world view and structures that are apparently dominating us, even if you die, you will still overcome. So we win the battle because of the blood of the Lamb, because he's already won it, and because of the word of their testimony. Now, this idea of witness and testimony is very, very common. Begin in Revelation 1 verse 5, reading that the Lord Jesus was the faithful and true witness, the faithful and true martyr. You see, that's the word, the Greek word is martyr. Jesus was the great martyr. But we also have a word of our testimony, of our martyrdom, if you like. So then, he is not just a martyr to be 
ad admired. Thought, oh yeah, one of our, our great man, he was the martyr. We are all martyrs. We are all in this fight and we shall overcome and take the victory in the end because of the word of our testimony or martyrdom, because of our being a martyr. Now, typically, a martyr is not the word used for the majority of the population. A group of people have their martyrs who inspire them. And of course, for those Jewish Christians in the first century, all they were hearing was the Maccabees, how it was centuries ago when Judas Maccabeus and so forth were martyrs and they, the martyrs, fought against the evil pagan Gentiles who were taking our temple and taking our country and we're going to do it again. We are going to be martyrs. Come on, who wants to be a suicide bomber? Who wants to be a martyr for the cause to establish the true kingdom of God, to kick out the Romans and so on? And the idea is, no, none of that. You're not going to achieve this kingdom of God in your own strength, nor by political pressure, nor by fighting, not by might, nor by strength, but by my spirit, as Zechariah 4 has said. And the idea is that we are all martyrs. As I say, typically it's a minority of a group who are the martyrs and the great inspirational figures in the community, in the movement, as it were. But no, we are all to make testimony. We are all martyrs. But what does that martyrdom look like? It's giving of our lives. See, this is all radical stuff, that we are called to martyrdom, to giving and sacrificing life. What's that look like? What it looks like for most believers down history, because most Christians have not been martyred, what it looks like is this, that you give your life for your Lord in belief of the things of his kingdom and his name. And you are not subsumed into this huge construct of this world that is around you, be it the call of militant Judaism, be it the cult of empire in the first century Roman Empire, be it the materialism in which many of us live today, for example, here in, in Europe, the principles of this world appear to be absolutely like a huge invincible dragon that's got everybody locked into it. But we give our lives in martyrdom for the cause of the ultimate kingdom. In the spirit of our great leader, who was the faithful and true martyr, his death becomes my death. This is what we signed up to in baptism, Romans 6, that his death, that he died, becomes my death. And his life, his resurrection life, becomes my life. That's what we signed up to in baptism, to die with Jesus, to give my life for him, that his life might come into me. We are then to make that witness unto death, verse 17. The dragon is angry with the woman and makes war with her seed who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony, the martyrdom of Jesus. So then we witness and we suffer because of that. It could be that a conversation comes up and you take a deep breath and turn that conversation around to the things of the Lord and the things of his kingdom and whoa, social death. You're then put on the outer at work in the workplace, in the family, or whatever. You make a comment these days on social media, oh, and you are unfriended, you hurt me, you upset me. That's contrary to whatever, British values or American values or whatever, so you say. But we are living differently under a different set of values. And so this is uh, very radical, radical stuff. But the people in the first century, the Jewish Christians, liked the idea of achieving victory in their own strength. To tell them, look, martyrdom, victory, struggle, etc., it's already happened. Jesus already did that. And we are going forward in the strength of what he already did. But there is this 
tendency in human nature to prefer seeking something rather than actually finding it. Paul says, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. People would prefer the idea that, yes, there is a great fight in front of me, that we must fight to get this because we haven't got it now, rather than saying, actually, it's all been done. Jesus has died. The new kingdom, the new empire is already established, but it's not revealed yet on this earth, but we're citizens of that new commonwealth of Israel. We have resigned, as it were, our citizenship in this world, and we are citizens of heaven. We are a colony, an outpost of heaven, as it says in the in Philippians. So he's, the idea of Revelation is to try to take their focus off the idea that through military conflict, through political pressure, we can get rid of Rome. No, no, no. It's beaten anyway. The dragon is a loser. And we have already overcome because we are in him who has overcome. That is the idea. We overcome, verse 11, by the blood of the Lamb. So then, his death has separated us, has brought us out of this world. The language of redemption is often used. Idea being that a slave could be bought out of slavery. And that's what the Lord's death that we memorize in this, uh, in this wine, that's the price paid for our redemption, that we're out of this world. That is what happened on, on Passover night. The lamb, the blood of the lamb, as it were, got them out of Egypt into the wilderness, which is, again, a motif that you've got here in Revelation 12, very clearly. When the Lord died on the cross, he killed Satan or the devil. However you want to interpret that, fundamentally, it is that which is the adversary of God. Sin, evil, in all its various manifestations, internally to us, in world structures, in Roman empires, or whatever it it might be. That has all been overcome. And yet, as you read here, it seems that, well, not so. Sure, it's been uh, overcome in heaven and cast out of heaven, but here on earth, uh, persecuting God's people unto the death. Well, this is the idea of apocalyptic here in the book of Revelation, that you get a glimpse of heaven, and then you see what's going on here on earth. The idea is that we have a, an insight into how God sees it, and we are to have God's perspective. Those who dwell on the earth, we are later to read in Revelation, say, who can make war against the beast? He's invincible. That's what it looks like, those on earth. But from heaven's perspective, the dragon down here on earth, as we've been reading here, is basically flailing around in his death throes. And that is the perspective that we should have. That this whole structure, this whole apparently invincible world situation that is as it is now, is actually the dragon in his death throes. Now, that does not mean that we actually will not suffer, that we're going to win, win, win in this life. Because it's very clear from here in Revelation 12 and later on in Revelation that actually the beast, the dragon, kills some of the people of God and persecutes them. They do not pull out a spear and kill him. No, he wins, apparently. And... Again, this is all the whole idea that the meaning of death has been totally reinterpreted and recalculated. They win, these people, which is us, because they did not love their life unto death. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, and they did not love their life even to death. Death, 
thereby becomes victory. And of course, this is all based on the Lord, on his death, which, again, from the earthbound perspective, the people watching the crucifixion would have thought, well, that's it, he's had it now. He didn't jump down from the cross, didn't pull off one of his miracles, did he? Is the body dead? Yep, dead. Soldiers checked it, verified it, he's a loser. Whereas in the eyes of God, he was lifted up in glory. I, if I be lifted up from the earth, shall draw all men unto me. And this lifting up idea is the idea in Hebrew of glory. That glory is that weight which is lifted up. And he has been lifted up. He has been glorified. He was glorified in his death. In the eyes of man, he was naked, covered in blood and spittle. Couldn't answer the Jews when they said, come down from the cross and we shall believe. And there would have been a silence. Yeah. Is he going to do it? Can he do it? No. But it was what Frederick Buchner called many years ago the magnificent defeat. The magnificent defeat, if ever. His death was the magnificent defeat. Through that death, through that apparent loss, through the apparent triumph of evil, the apparent triumph of Roman and Jewish power over him, he won absolutely gloriously and so it is with us and in fact with all God's children they did not love their lives even to death and because of the blood of the lamb they overcame him they overcame the dragon he won they died but because of that they won so as I say he has Jesus's death has recalculated and reinterpreted the meaning of death now death is of course in this world you know, the, the ultimate lose-lose, isn't it? That you have your life, you enjoy yourself, supposedly. You build up your chips, supposedly. You get your great pension plan, supposedly. Now, this is the myth, isn't it, that you achieve all this? Ah. And then it's game over. Death. And your faculties go down and down and down. And there's not much you can do about that. You can't stop Anno Domini and the uh, Anno does domini, the years do dominate, and in the end, that's it. Your grave planks, sir. Lose. Whereas, for the runner towards God's kingdom, who is running the race, as Paul says, actually, that final bit, as your faculties go down, as you face, yes, your death, this is the final spurt to victory. This is the final spurt to victory, spiritually, from God's perspective. Think of God looking at an old man in his 80s, maybe 90s, who's losing it, you know. But he's focused on the kingdom and he sorted out his conscience with God, repented of his sins, does his little bit, gives his bit of pension money to this sort of that, trying to do all he can for the Lord and is good with God forgiven, can't wait for the kingdom. He, he's speeding up spiritually. He's on the final spurt. Death, therefore, is no longer lose-lose. It has been reinterpreted in the light of the Lord's death to be the magnificent defeat. Absolutely, the magnificent defeat. So they did not love their lives unto the death. This is language taken right out of the appeals for martyrdom that were being made to the Jewish Christians. Come on, be a martyr for the cause, for the cause of fighting Rome. and Be faithful to death. Don't love your life. Give your life. Yeah. This is for all of us. Do not think this just applies to the Christian martyrs. We are all overcomers. You get this towards the end of Revelation where you read things like, he that overcomes, this again is, the language of struggle, the language of resistance and victory and fighting to the end and achieving your revolution. He that overcomes will inherit all things, but the fearful and the unbelieving shall be cast away. In other words, we are all called to this. The language of martyrdom, the language of witness, the, the language of overcoming, of fighting and winning is not just for the Christian martyrs who physically, literally, 
gave their lives at the stake or whatever. It is for every single one of us. So, as I say, be it social death, be it whatever, we are called to give our lives. We signed up for that in baptism when we, as it were, died with, with Jesus. And you know, we are all part of the armies in heaven, as it were, that follow Jesus on white horses. It doesn't mean you physically go to heaven. That is to miss the whole point. That revelation is flitting between heaven and earth to show us what well, is the reality on earth. And this is the reality in heaven, how God sees it. All the human world systems, the beasts, etc., are repeatedly described as being untrue. For example, here in Revelation 12, uh, verse 9, the dragon deceives. The dragon is a deceiver. The dragon is a liar. He deceives the whole world. You've got that in chapter 13, chapter 18, Babylon, the beasts, the dragon. These are liars. Whereas the followers of the Lamb in Revelation are described as having no deceit in their mouths. In other words, the, these world systems that appear to be invincible are in fact fake and liars. It is not true that actually there is no more to existence than this whole system that is around us. Just as in the first century, it was not true that the only and final reality is the Roman Empire, with Rome as the big city and Caesar as our, our wonderful king. No. There was another reality of the kingdom of God. And, and so, you know, you can interpret it in different, different ways. But we are asked to see that the whole world structure of the world around us in whatever period of time we live, whatever geographical situation, whatever part of history, all this is fake. The world we live in is, in fact, a totalitarian ideological regime. You may say, oh, we don't live in a totalitarian regime. We have a liberal government and blah, blah, blah. No. It is. This is a totalitarian regime where the structures defining values, the images which are defining society are all based around lust, pride, sex, hedonism. That's what governs society. Whereas here in Revelation, you, it's so visual, you've got these other images that all that stuff is chucked out. All that is a dragon and it's in its death throes, and red blood of Jesus will conquer the red dragon. Red beats red in this. And here in chapter 12, verse 12, we're told that, okay, he gets chucked out, and he's very angry because he knows, this dragon, that he has but a short time, or a little while. So all this stuff is only for a little while. The whole thing is in its death throes. If you've got half a brain, you can actually see that the whole structure anyway is in its death throes. But even apart from that, we are told here that whatever, it is only for a short time. And that is repeated at least three times in Revelation, that from God's perspective, and his perspective must be ours, this whole thing is only for a short time. 12, 60 days, 42 months, or as it says here, he's only got a short time. Now, you may say, well, what comfort is that to people whose whole lives were messed up by this evil system or the evil system in which they lived? What comfort was that for those who were killed by, let's say, Roman persecution of Christians in the, uh, in the third century or, or whatever? What comfort was that? Well, it's a comfort of perspective that this whole thing, even if you cough and hack your way through 70 years of persecution or whatever, this is only for a short time. But you'll only take comfort from that if you see it from heaven's perspective, that the eternity of God's kingdom is ahead, and I'm definitely going to be there because Jesus died for me, and that's all we're here to celebrate, and therefore this whole life is just a, a short time. It is only a little while. 
And I think that that is why you have this reference repeatedly in the New Testament, but particularly in Revelation, that Jesus says, I am coming soon. And cynics and skeptics say, yeah, well, he didn't come, did he? He said, I'm coming soon in the first century. Where is he? Well, that's a question of perspective. Like saying the suffering is for a little while. You may say, well, a little while, three and a half years, that's a pretty long time to suffer. Yes, so it is. Uh, it is a long time to suffer, but it depends. All this kind of thing, suffering and so forth, is all a case of perception and length of time. Time itself is perception. Sorry to get philosophical, but that's true. It is all a case of, of scale. You know? Is three and a half years or 70 years, is this a short time or a long time? Well, it depends your perspective, doesn't it? If you don't believe in eternal life, and you only, like these miserable sceptics and cynics who say, yeah, Jesus said he was coming soon, he never did. Of course, their perspective is, well, all you've got is one life, 70 years, so he said he was coming then and he didn't. So, well, he didn't say he was coming then, he said, I'm coming soon. Right? Well, no. If you've got the perspective of eternity, that I know that because of what Jesus did, that for sure, our hope is solid, as solid as an anchor, Anchor of the soul, short and steadfast, Hebrews says. Well, that eternity is guaranteed for me. So then, whatever in this life, be it a couple of years of difficulty, or be it a whole life of difficulty, this is a short time. But I can only feel it's a short time, and I can only feel that Jesus is coming soon, if I have that perspective of eternity in front of me. And of course, this is what we're invited to. To, to take the perspective of heaven. As I say, it's why these visions are flitting between heaven and earth. Yeah. On earth, yeah, the beast seems invincible. Who can stand before the beast? Oh, might as well, if you can't beat them, join them. Whereas from God's perspective, from the heavenly perspective, the beast has been chucked out. The beast has been killed by the lamb. The lamb beat the dragon. The lamb with bit of red blood on him because he's a sacrificed lamb, a lamb freshly slain. It was red on red, and red beat red. Or white plus red beat red. He's already out. He's just a, a loser. The whole thing is a loser. whole thing. Well, as I say, this call to martyrdom, this call to a radical life, to a brave life, is kind of attractive because there is a rebel in each of us somewhere, especially when you're younger. But man is, man is a rebel without a real cause, it seems to me. Yeah. Why You meet people in their youth got really caught up with this political party or joined some military group and fought for this, that or the other. If they survive that and they get to middle age, they normally turn to alcohol or drugs or something because... Ah, but it wasn't like we thought. Our leaders turned out to have feet of clay. And, okay, well, we won the revolution, but look what happened. Yeah, we kicked out, for example, the, the communist rulership. And what did we get? Oh, yeah, but you see, it, it isn't right how it is now. It's not what we fought for. Whereas for us, none of that, none of that. This is the ultimate cause. And as I say, man has that dimension to him to want to be a rebel to want to be a non-conformist but also there is this overpowering almost pressure to conform because man is but a sheep and we all like sheep go astray and so this call as i say to idealism to living for another reality to revolution to victory against impossible odds, for you to be the David who beats Goliath. Yeah, there's something in us that says yes to that. I'm interested. Uh, but very soon, people slide back into the mire of mediocrity very easily. And you see that all around us. See, young people in particular, yeah, have this idealism, this desire to overthrow the existing system, to love not their life unto, the, unto death, yes, to be totally devoted to this or to that worldview or to this or to that revolutionary agenda. And it drops down. As they get 
you know, kids and mortgage and the stuff that goes with life. And all that, you know, the radical, the rebel sort of dies out. But it's sort of there, but not much. Well, you see, that strain that there is in human nature in all of us, to, to want to be a nonconformist, to want to be a radical, to, to kick the ties that bind, to be different, to live not in this reality but in another one. You see, that is where the gospel meets that. Absolutely. And meets it in a way that will not disappoint. Sometimes you read or listen to interviews with people who have been radicalised as radical Islamist terrorist suicide bombers. And some of them see what's happened to them if they don't actually kill themselves. There's some very interesting interviews of those people. And the ones that I've seen are people who grew up in areas that I grew up in and who didn't have a great life, were on minimum wage, did what people do um, when you're young, you know, fornicate, drugs, get drunk, this and that. But life was sort of kind of pointless. And just an existence, that's what they say, and they're right, that's all that sort of thing is. And yeah, girlfriends, boyfriends, or, or whatever, but yeah, nothing really amazing. Oh, wow. Well, they met. There's somebody who radicalised them, who said, oh, all this is crap. You don't want to go for all this, do you? No, yeah, I agree with you, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, here's the way to go, mate. Look here, there's all this ideology here. You can give your life. Be pure. Uh, be, be clean. Uh, give your life. Smash this system. Go on, be a suicide bomber. Go do this. You can do this. And then you're going to get great reward in heaven afterwards. You're going to get whatever they offer them. You know, seven wives. I don't know what the, what the girls get, but seven blokes, I don't know. Uh, you get this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And some of those people, when I've seen those interviews, I think, oh, dang, I wish I could have met that man or that woman before they met the, you know, the radicalizers and got them for Jesus Christ. Or well, not me, but one of us could have got that young that person for Jesus Christ. Because, yeah, when they tell the story of how they grew up on a council estate back there in South London, and, ah, oh, yeah, you know, it was just drugs and getting drunk and, you know, hanging around, hooning around, and it was not much of a life. Uh, and, ah, oh, then I met this radical ide ideology, and it, it's, yeah, yeah, I liked it. It gave me something to live for. You think, oh, what a shame we could not have met that person and given them Jesus Christ and given them absolutely the principles of radical love, radical grace, radical achievement of God's kingdom to live for, you know? But, all right, what about you and me? You and me also, like everybody else, look at this world and think, oh, yeah, you know, yeah this isn't much. Give me, give me some idealism. Give me something to fight for. Give me something to, to really get my teeth into. Yeah, people will talk about this sort of stuff over coffee in you know, great enthusiasm and then change the, change the topic of conversation, drifts off and uh, it was just a nice idea. And, oh, yes, yes, we're young radicals. And, you know, but, look, the call of Jesus Christ is to love not your life unto death. It is of witness martyrdom. Remember, that's what the Greek word is all the way through there. And we are already winners because we have the one who went before us, who was the faithful and true witness unto death, who soon will come because all this is passing away. The world is passing away and the lusts thereof. But he that does the will of God lives forever because I live our Lord said, you shall live also. Heavenly Father, we come to thank you for your Son, who got all this more than any of us ever do, and has given his life the faithful, the faithful and the true witness and martyr. And we pray, Father, that we, in the spirit of his love, in the spirit of his self-sacrifice, might do the same. Give us, Father, the leads and the openings and the opportunities to testify, to witness to him and to his word and to focus on the things of his kingdom and help us, Father, to encourage others to join in this 
wonderful movement that he has started and that shall never be stopped until finally he visibly returns to this earth and establishes your kingdom and we shall meet him for his sake. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Father, seeing the ultimate sacrifice of your Son who paid that ultimate price in every way for us. And we see our desire to follow him, but yet we see our weakness. That we follow him from afar off, and we are not as him. We thank you, though, Father, that through his blood we still are more than conquerors through him that loved us, because we believe and we know that you will forgive us that huge gap wherein we fail to be as him. But Father, he there inspires us. And we pray, Father, that you will empower us so that his living, his life, and his death might be mine for his sake, for the sake of all he was, for the sake of all he achieved in his death, for the sake, Father, of all that he is now. For his sake, please hear us. Amen.